we've got a couple of days today here and then just down the road to try and talk about um, these trials within cohorts and in particular I think to have a have a go at sorting some problems out that are uh, bugging people around I don't know the, the sort of ethical requirements if we're going to conduct Twix about what you know what is n necessary uh, uh, on the ethical side and um, you know I guess there are a lot of people here who've got some experience of trying Twix or talking to people about Twix <coughs> or even possibly putting Twix into ethics committees and I expect we've all had a different response uh, to that so to understand what those experiences are and uh, to try to think our way through to some sort of coherent uh, position seems to be like uh, a good thing uh, to do uh, over the next couple of days so we'll see we'll see where we we get to but it is my uh, my great pleasure just to welcome you to this and I hope you're going to get something out of it and I wanted just to take two minutes just to so well I've got the privilege of being able to just tell you what my view is not that I need any uh, <laughs> permission to do that so I just wanted to start and I'm going to okay well, the first thing is, I just, I, what I want to talk about is informed consent, is essentially. And of course, the first thing to start with is to say that perhaps um, this sort of uh, widespread view that informed consent is always required is just not true. Okay. I mean, I think, I suspect everybody in this room knows that. But this is the example I like. This is just because this is the field in which I work in emergency uh, medicine. And uh, we uh, faced with this example from the crash trial, uh, the crash two trial, uh, a few years ago, have come to articulate this uh, problem very clearly now. What the crash two trial, which is a trial of uh, giving um, a coagulant to people who are essentially dying from bleeding injuries. And you can give this coagulant tranexamic acid but it turns out it's it's very effective if it's given early and it's very ineffective if it's if it's given late okay that's the, the, the critical thing and what uh, what we what we worked out the, the trial itself actually said that it uh, that giving uh, tranexamic acid was re reducing uh, deaths by 15 percent this is a remarkable uh, effect and actually you know, the presidents of the United States are now followed around by a little black bag, which contains a few things, and tranexamic acid. This is, this is now your, uh, and it's widely used in all military, uh, uh, on military battlefields. It, it, it is dramatically effective. But if you had run the whole trial exactly as it went, but given in every case tranexamic acid an hour later than it was actually given, there would have been no effect whatsoever. Yeah? The effectiveness of a placebo, just a, a, a saline injection, and tranexamic acid would have been identical. And we would have concluded that tranexamic acid didn't work. So what you, you learn from this very dramatic example is that um, in emergency care, treatment effectiveness is time related. The earlier treatments are given in genuine emergencies, the more effective they are. And the later they're given, the less effective they are. Now think about what the burden of infor getting informed consent. In emergencies, getting informed consent is practically difficult. We all know that. Trying to find legal guardians, chasing around uh, departments uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, people very often can't self consent for rather obvious reasons. Not only may they not be uh, conscious, but uh, even if they are conscious, they tend to be distressed. And the cons informed consent is almost impossible. So you're seeking relatives or le legal, uh, legal guidance. And th that is a laborious process. So the consequence is, is that if you seek informed consent, you're not actually measuring the, the true effectiveness uh, of the treatment. And the consequence is that 
It is now, as was always allowed actually in the Helsinki Convention, it is now widely recognized that in emergency care trials where treatments are time dependent and effectiveness is time dependent, that uh, seeking informed consent uh, ab initio is, is not necessary. Now, uh, that, I'm giving this example not because I particularly wish to talk about this example, but simply as a, as a case of which there are many others where informed consent is not necessary. And the point is that is broken one, instantly broken one apparent rule that people have in their mind that informed consent is always necessary. The answer is it's not. So now we're free to think, well, is it necessary in, in Twix? So the, the first thing is, uh, that is just to notice uh, this important thing about conventional trials. I mean, this is a, a cartoon of a conventional trial, which is that they're symmetrical. They're, they, they have a symmetry in the sense that there is some eligible population they get randomly allocated into one of two treatments. And uh, the, the treatments may, uh, of course, the treatments are different, but in, they may have e even e have equal state status. Sometimes one is a placebo and the other is an active treatment where they don't, but sometimes one's treatment is usual and a new treatment or even two new treatments and so on. But the point is the design is symmetrical. And partly as a consequence of the symmetry of the design is there's a symmetry in the ethical uh, burden. But when you come to a Twix, there is no symmetry. This is the fundamental uh, difference. So Twix aren't, symmetry, aren't symmetrical. Claire, I think you're going to talk next, and you're going to tell us what a Twix is. Yes. This is my cartoon of a Twix. Um, uh, you have some sort of cohort which is being followed up over time. If it's not being followed up over time, it's not a cohort. It's just a collection of people, and it's probably a registry. <laughs> I'll, let's not get into definitions just yet. Merrick <laughs> asked me. So, but a cohort is a, a, it has, has, is a cohort. It has to be followed up over time. So it's being followed up over time. And in a Twix, what happens is essentially is that some eligible patients are from the co are selected from the cohort, and they are off <laughs> offered a treatment, and their outcomes are measured, and then they can be compared with other eligible patients in the co cohort as a, as, at a later date. But the point is that there is this a, a, a symmetry here. There's a whole cohort, and there's some selection uh, of patients uh, for treatment. And of course, selection and allocation are not the same thing. This is, this is the, the, the crucial conceptual idea about which I have had many um, <clears throat> vigorous discussions, or whatever the current American terminology for what's uh, been going on uh, uh, is, um, uh, about this. But they are not the same, same thing. And there is no sense in which, of course, uh, that uh, in a lottery that uh, people whose numbers don't come up were allocated to being a loser. That would be, <laughs> wouldn't work very well. Um, uh, we, 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 select, we select winners. Um, and the same is true in, in, a, in a Twix, uh, that uh, patients are not being allocated to just continuing in the cohort. Some patients are being selected to be offered uh, the, uh, the treatment, and we don't have to tell those who weren't selected that indeed they, they weren't selected. So, so what is the informed consent burden? And I'm you know, li literally going to finish. Well, I mean, what you consent to, I mean, Claire has, a, uh, has endlessly told me about the consent is for lots and lots of different things. And clearly it is in conventional consent. You know, we consent to treatment, the process of uh, allocation, so the collection of data and its storage and and possible sharing, and possibly other, all sorts of uh, processes uh, uh, in the research, and maybe many others that I couldn't think of. But the question is, which of these are actually um, necessary or not in, in, in cohort trials? Well, the answer is that, 
that the, the, um, the uh, d depends on which group you are, whether you need to be informed about the treatment, of course, uh, that if you're being selected for some, to be offered a new treatment, then of course you need to be told about the new treatment, but if you're not selected, you don't. And of course there isn't a process of randomization. Nobody needs to be told uh, about the process of randomization, just those who are selected, that they have been selected to be offered a treatment at random. But of course all the trial processes and about data collection and sharing, uh, everybody still needs uh, consent uh, for. But these are essentially the processes of, of consenting to be part of the cohort, because as you'll remember, that is what the cohort is about, is about data collection and uh, the data, the use of data and data sharing and so on. So what, what, what would I like to see uh, uh, as reach a point. What I'd like to see as reach a point is where we could actually think about the possibility of having some sort of position statement about what the ethical requirements in the conducting of Twix are. This is the extreme position which I would love to be uh, the, the, the case that, um, that uh, People who aren't selected for, uh, to be offered treatment don't need to be told about the trial. Now, there are lots of slight versions of this which you can row, row back on. This is the, what I consider to be the extreme uh, position. But I put that up partly to provoke you. But essentially, what I think it would be lovely to feel that we were edging our way to some consensus about what the... Uh, ethical requirements for consent were in Twix. Okay, thanks. That's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. So you can react now. Well, you're all very passive at the moment. You're obviously... Was there a lack of buns outside? So, <laughs> so, a lack of sugar, sorry. Um, so it's Rosie from uh, Barn and Bradford. I absolutely agree with that oh, last position right. statement. So yeah. I'd like us to sort of think about how we can move that forward. And so that yeah, well, I, I think just to have that in mind for everybody in the discussion today, yeah. or something in mind is what I'm saying, the idea of trying to reach it would be a great thing. Thank you, Rosie. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you you can have an extra bun at uh, lunchtime. <laughs> 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 so, I don't know if this is because from New York, I don't really like buns, so I can subside. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel free to say this. Um, I didn't really actually agree with that, no. the way that you put that in, because it's, so, it's too vague, right? When we say tell them about the trial, we yeah. never tell patients everything about a trial. It would be impossible. Oh, well, we, you know, we analyze the results with a longitudinal model, blah, 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 blah. We always select what we tell patients about the trial. And I think in the, um, in the Twix, so you, you're saying, you, know, you already said we're going we're gonna to tell you about the data collection. I'm telling you about the cohort is what. Yeah. I was trying that to distinguish be, yeah. between those two things. I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. So, so do we tell people everything about the trial? Well, unfortunately, there is an attempt to. Uh, those of you who, um, who are in the UK, at any rate, which of course includes yourself, uh, may, may remember the terrible story of TGN 1412. So TGN 1412 was a drug that was uh, trialed, uh, first in man, an uh, early phase trial. Uh, just up, up the road uh, uh, here, and it uh, was given to six patients with appalling consequences. I mean, they, um, uh, the the uh, the harm they suffered was almost indescribable. But these patients had uh, uh, there was no criticism of the information they had, but there should have been because the information they had was a 17-page information booklet. They tried to give them every piece of information about the trial possible. Of course, in the process of doing that, failed to inform them at all. It was just too much. No, so, I, I, so, I, so we do try and give people every piece of information, and that is a mistake oh, when we try and do it. Yeah, no, look, I, think, I completely agree. I've actually right, written right. about information overload. Yes, absolutely. It's crucial decision making. I, I was just saying, I think I broadly agree, but to oh, me, no, the this question is more, 
I, I think we have to think more of a spectrum. Yes, I, right? I, 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 Rather than we're either going to tell you everything about the trial or nothing about the trial, uh, you know, it's like, okay, what do we actually need to tell people about trials? Yes. And then if we think about it in that way, we can deal with exactly the issue right. that you're right. doing. I work in a cancer hospital, a typical cancer drug has you know, pages yeah. of side effects. Yeah. No one reads the consent form and because it's completely overwhelming. I know, then they lose the, the important bits as well, exactly. such as, oh, this exactly. drug might kill you, which sort of is, is, seems to me to be rather critical uh, to, to have... Uh, so listen, I, 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 I'm, my observation that there was a lack of sugar in the room is probably was probably not right, <laughs> uh, and uh, and I can see that we could start with a with a great discussion. I'm a, I'm very broadly sympathetic. This was just trying to get a few words on a page. Of course, we're going to have to be much more nuanced about it, but I do really want to push on because um, we've got. Uh, Claire and then uh, America, you've, you're going to talk as well uh, this morning, and they've got two much more important uh, uh, talks to give. So if you don't mind, I think we, we will just push on.